Roger, I'm going to rescue you now. <laughs> everybody could take their seats uh, I'll rescue Roger from the questions that he's still getting uh, and graciously answering to do an introduction for our next speaker okay Christopher Moore curates the National Air and Space Museum's collection of aircraft armament and the model aircraft collection he has also recently taken responsibility for the museum's collection of pre-1920 aircraft. He serves as curator for the newly opened Early Flight Gallery at the museum and is a supporting curator for the World War I, World War II, and modern military galleries, especially on the subject of aircraft armament. Prior to joining the Smithsonian, he served as an officer in the United States Coast Guard, specializing in aviation, navigation, and marine safety. He was a collection specialist with the National Museum of American History before joining the Air and Space Museum. He has a BA in European History from the University of California, San Diego, and an MA in American History from George Mason University. Please welcome Christopher Moore. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thank you. It's very good to be here. Um, I'm going to follow those words of wisdom that I heard yesterday from Ted. Keep to the script. Don't uh, ad lib. Um, real quick, funny story. Um, my first, uh, my first uh, um, presentation I did at the local uh, chapter of the league in D.C., I went 45 minutes over my time, basically doubled. Uh, Carl came to me and said, you owe me 45 minutes. So I, I can't afford to owe any of more of my life to Carl. So... <laughs> You remember that. Okay, um, yeah, thanks to Roger for setting the scene for me. Um, so, um, you, you know, with the themes and layout of the gallery, you can see why Roger's in charge. He just, he's got so many plates spinning in the air and he knows where they're all at. And not only one, but two galleries. So, um, I tend to be more of a uh, down in the weeds artifact. He's the 20,000 foot view. Um, but he does, you know, also do artifacts. Um, but I tend to be down on the 500-foot uh, view. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, the artifacts that will be on display. And thank you, Roger, for not uh, um, stealing my thunder too much on the <laughs> some of the artifacts. You will see some of the same, but hopefully I'll talk a little more. Um, so it's been 30 years, as Roger said, uh, since the last revision of the gallery, and that's even before I started at the museum. Uh, so it's nice to be able to um, take a fresh look, not only at the presentation, but the artifacts in our collection that have not been on display recently, or some even ever before. The new gallery will also have more artifacts on display than the old one. When planning a museum gallery, there's an interesting interplay between what you want to say and the stories you want to tell on the one hand, and what artifacts you have in the collection that can support those stories. After all, it's the artifacts which make a museum special. So you can't write a script without knowing what artifacts can support it. And conversely, you can't choose your favorite artifacts without them being able to support the story you're telling. The National Air and Space Museum is fortunate in having a varied collection of World War I aviation artifacts to draw on. And here I'm going to uh, embarrass Carl again. Um, I want to publicly acknowledge his contributions to the gallery, and especially um, when he was uh, working at the museum, um, and especially in his efforts to make the team aware of just what artifacts were available. Um, near the start of the process, Carl went into our database and gathered everything that was remotely World War, War, World War I related or immediately post-war, and he put all these into what we call an object package in our database. So. Um, this gave us basically a shopping list of artifacts that we could use for the gallery. So that's the fun part, when you see the objects, all the objects you'd forgotten about or didn't even know the museum had. Um, and you want to include everything, of course. But then begins the hard process of deciding what supports the gallery script, and then later down the road, when the designers get involved, what might have to be cut due to space limitations. So I chose these artifacts to talk about today because most of them were not in the last version of the World War I gallery, 
Some haven't been on display at the museum for years, and some never. Some are recent acquisitions, and some have been in the collection since shortly after the war. I'm going to give a little background on each and things we learned in the process of getting them ready for display in the gallery. And all of these artifacts required some level of treatment to ready them for display. And I'll mention some of the more challenging ones of, uh, in that respect. There we go. So rather than try um, to place the artifacts by their place location in the gallery with maps, like you saw in Roger's uh, presentation, I went ahead and grouped them in these five categories, as you can see. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first group is insignia. Um, this is, of course, aircraft insignia and not uniform insignia. And for those of you that recognize this photo of the Red Baron's bedroom, we do not have any of those <laughs> serial numbers. <laughs> we wish we did. What we do have is a piece of fabric from the U.S. 13th Aero Squadron with the squadron's uh, Grim Reaper emblem, which I had read is called Grim Oscar, and I couldn't find any... <laughs> Veri verification of that, so if anybody knows about that story, let me know. Um, the 13th became operational on SPAD 13s in mid-1918 and joined the second pursuit group near Toul, where they flew in the San Mihel and Muzargan battles. And just as a quick aside, Major Carl Spatz, who is more often associated with World War II, was able to fly as a supernumerary pilot for three weeks with the squadron and was credited with two victories. And what you're seeing here is the aircraft of Major Charles Biddle. So our piece is from the spad of Leighton Brewer and was donated by his wife in 1969. When we received the fabric, it was mounted to a paperboard backing with hide glue, basically made out of animal hide, common, common glue in the old days. And then it was framed. This is how it looked, still on its backing, but removed from the frame. So not too bad, a little peeling around the edges. This is the interesting part. When the conservators removed the frame, they found copies of newspapers dating from 1918 that they just used, stuck in the back to kind of pad it out. So you got the New York Times. Uh, so it was obviously was framed in 1918, so either shortly after the war, probably, um, but early on, and it's, it, it's been that way until recently. So one of my favorite details that you don't notice right away is the skeleton has a gold tooth. And <laughs> there's a, a, a magnified view, and you can kind of get a, an idea of how the dope fabric and the paint and everything lay down together. So to prepare the emblem for display, it is first removed from the backing and cleaned and loose paint consolidated. Then stable exhibition fabric is attached to a wood frame and the insignia is adhered to this fabric with a rever reversible heat, seat gl heat set glue. Uh, the finished mount will then be framed with plexiglass and glazing and hung on the wall. And this is its uh, adhered to that uh, conservation fabric. There's the back side. Um, so this is how it looks at the back. The, um, this method provides support for the painted fabric and a stable environment for its long-term preservation. The rest of the insignia I will talk about are mounted in the same method, so I'm not gonna go over this for each one. But uh, you can see they, uh, what they actually do is they, they trace the uh, outline of the fabric and then they lay the glue down first onto the fabric. Um, and there you can see it's bled through on the fabric, but it dries and then they use heat to set the, the uh, airplane fabric to that. And that's all, uh, everything they do is um, reversible. They could, if they had to, they can take it off. When we do do some in painting to fill in blank spots, it's with watercolor paints that they, that technically all this could be done uh, re reversible because you don't want to change any of the, uh, the original artifact. So 
Okay, um, this one might be a little controversial, but I don't know if I'm going to go into that. Uh, the German insignia is reputed to be from the German Albatross D5A that was shot down April 14, 1918, by Lieutenant Alan F. Winslow of the 94th Aero Squadron, flying in Newport 28 near Toul, France. It was the first German aircraft to be brought down by an officer of the U.S. Air Service in the war. And uh, here it's interesting because you can see how the earlier Iron Cross was painted over and uh, they kind of got this really fat uh, uh, later cross. And there's uh, typical uh, how these things were just glued onto this pasteboard, uh, masonite, something like that, and uh, how they uh, look after, you know, a hundred years. So here it is mounted in its nice uh, backing and framed and, and with a plexiglass glazing. This was sort of the, the test for the framing method, so this is the only one I have that shows it being framed. It, uh, it has a metal frame and, and plexiglass glazing. And then there's this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is a, a French roundel which uh, you can't really tell right now. And this gives you a, an idea of how insignia that hasn't been previously mounted but was rolled can present a, a pretty big challenge. This is how it looked coming out of storage. So um, this is our conservators, and what they had to do was slowly uh, uh, unroll it while uh, hitting it with the heat gun to get, make sure they weren't cracking the paint, which had formed into this rolled shape. Uh, the fabric's all, you know, dried out and uh, doesn't want to go. So slowly they're weighting it down, heating it, and rolling it. Now, once they did this process, it still actually wasn't uh, in a good shape. So um, what they did was actually that whole table is heated. So they put it on a heated table so it had a heat source. And then they built what they call a humidity chamber around it. So basically you put um, a liquid in there and pretty much just water and it gets absorbed into the air and then absorbed into the fabric, rehumidifies the dried fabric and uh, it's a common process with paintings and, and old paper uh, items. Uh, but you can see this was in pretty bad shape and in fact it, it had split in the middle there um, from being rolled like that. And there's the finished insignia, ready for display. It has been cleaned and adhered to the fabric in areas of paint loss, such as that middle seam, have been inpainted with watercolors. It still has some staining and creasing, but looks much better than when it started. And you saw this one in Rogers. This is a, a pretty rare insignia. This is the German national insignia from a Parsifal observation balloon. The insignia is a rec recent acquisition, and uh, we can thank Larry for this <laughs> when he was at the museum. Uh, it was transferred from his current employer, the National Museum of the Marine Corps, in 2020. Uh, the fabric had been given to the men of the U.S. Marine Corps' 6th Machine Gun Battalion, had been given by the men to their commander, Major Littleton W. T. Waller, Jr., but uh, it isn't actually recorded whether that unit shot down this balloon. It was just something they gave to their commander, as far as we know. And to give you an idea where that insignia is on the balloon, um, there's this picture and, and kind of the scale with the people down on the bottom. Okay, th so the insignia got a, a similar treatment to the others, um, but its size made it more of a challenge. As I said, it's about seven feet tall. Also, the fabric was sandwiched between plywood on the back and glass on the front, and some of the original insignia paint had stuck to the glass. And you can see that's one of the problems with these older uh, methods. And so they had to actually remove the paint, scrape it from the glass, and then glue it back onto the fabric, um, which our conservators are wonders at doing that type of stuff uh, and re-adhered. Um, but on this one, it was so large that instead of a wooden frame, um, the display fabric that they mounted to um, was glued to a honeycomb aluminum structure. 
and um, that's the, the finished insignia there. That's what it looks like. So that'll be up on, on the wall in the gallery. Okay, my next category I'm calling equipment, but it really is anything besides the airframe and the aircrew that helps accomplish the mission. One of our main assertions in the gallery script is that, the World War, is that World War I served as a laboratory for new innovations that would come to be common in aerial warfare. The common view of men doing battle in the sky, not only facing the enemy, but the dangers of their primitive aircraft, compounded by a hostile environment, doesn't really tell the whole story. Advances in avionics, life support, and communications equipment began to be tested, mostly during the final years of the war, and though many were not perfected or widely available before the war ended, they did represent a foundation that would be built upon in the future. So flying clothing is an important part of the air crew's equipment, especially in the era of open, unheated cockpits. Early in the war, specialized flight clothing often had to be privately purchased because military supplies were not up to the task. By the time the U.S. The US entered the war, uh, the Air Service benefited from the experience gained by their allies. The U.S. adopted a copy of the British Sidcut suit as a warm um, coverall. This U.S. flying suit here was worn by a famous U.S. aviator, and here's a picture of him wearing it. As you can see in this photo, Billy Mitchell wore this suit as the leader of the air phase of the Battle of San Miguel, which was one of the first coordinated air ground offensives in history, and later as commander of all American air combat units in France. <laughs> so, and also the fur-lined helmet and Luxor goggles were also essential to keeping the airmen warm and able to function at freezing temperatures. Fur-lined boots would uh, often be worn over their service shoes or service boots. Uh, this moccasin style met with metal closures was commonly worn by American aviators. So this oxygen mask was somewhat of an enigma at the museum. It was donated with a group of 982 objects, mostly aircraft instruments, by the U.S. Bureau of Standards in 1957. It was only listed as an English oxygen mask. Bearing a slight resemblance to the British mask worn at the beginning of World War II, the curator for their uh, flight clothing displayed it with other items from that war as seen here. This was out at the Hazy Center. But several years ago, I received an email from a friend who collects British flight gear. He suggested that the mask was not World War II vintage, but was from the World War I British drier oxygen system. A quick search for photos confirmed that this is the rare World War I drier oxygen mask you can see being fitted here. And believe me, I compared a lot of the details and they <laughs> everything's the same. Uh, the drier system was developed by British Lieutenant Colonel George C. Dreyer of the Royal Army Medical Corps in 1917. It was manufactured by Jacques de Lestang in Paris Parts were individually crafted, and production was always slow. The U.S., which entered the war in the same month as production began, held trials of the available systems, and the U.S. adopted the dryer. French production was so slow that the U.S. did not get a system to copy until October of 1917. As with many things, adapting production to U.S. assembly line methods did not go smoothly. And, U and U.S. made oxygen systems only began to appear in the last months of the war. Besides the modifications necessary to adapt to U.S. manufacture, the American dryer mask included a radio microphone. Now, how widespread and effective the use of breathing oxygen was during the war is debatable. Uh, the systems in use on all sides proved to have reliability problems but the fact that systems were designed and issued to address the problems of high altitude flight show the warring powers realized that technology could increase the effectiveness of not only the aircraft, but the air, cr air crew too. So this photo um, shows the detail of the elastic head strap and aluminum hose connection. 
Uh, got a shot of the inside. You can see it's lined with velour and fur uh, around the edges that keep it from freezing to the face, but pretty primitive there on the inside. And here's how we will display it to be able to properly support it uh, without any undue strain on the parts. The elastic is pretty much stretched out. Um, this, as far as I know, may be one of the few or perhaps only of these masks on display anywhere in the world. So, uh, as Roger uh, alluded to, ro uh, radio is another of those innovations that our common museum visitor uh, probably does not normally associate with World War I. Radio, or wireless as it was called, was still in its infancy, but the advantages to aviation were realized during the war. The U.S. Navy was a driver of new technologies at the time. Since ships and then long-range patrol aircraft operated far from shore, uh, the service actually pr actively pursued radio communication. Early spark and Morse-only equipment gave way to more advanced voice transmission. This is the SE 1100 radio transceiver manufactured by the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company of America with its oil cloth covers, um, and this is mounted in the museum's uh, Felix Stowe F5L. It could tr transmit voice at distances of up to 50 nautical miles and Morse code communication up to 120 nautical miles. Initially designed for use on H-16 flying boats, it was one of the first radio sets widely used in and the first tube set developed for naval aircraft. So this is the SE-1100 set that will be in the gallery. And from the front there, uh, the radio doesn't really appear that dated. Um, but you see the internals, uh, show they, they show the technology of the time. Wood parts used as insulators um, and the massive vacuum tube date the radio. Uh, the part behind the, the vacuum tube there is a coil and it's just made of wire wrapped around a paper cylinder. So the Army also realized the advantages of air crew in reconnaissance and artillery spotting aircraft being able to report real-time information to personnel on the ground. Observation balloons used wired telephones, but this wasn't practical for airplanes, and a radio telephone, telephone was needed. The Army asked companies to submit designs that met the requirements that, quote, the radio was condensed to a size that could fit inside the airplane, simple for an observer to use in flight, and the antenna would not drastically affect the movements of the aircraft, end quote. Western Electric's design was accepted and designated the Set Complete Radio, or SCR, 68. Performance, though, wasn't great, with a maximum ra range of 18 miles with a reliable range of only 5 miles, but it was a first step to developing effective aerial communications. The complete outfit included a wind-driven generator for power, as you see here on our DH-4, and a wire antenna that could be reeled out for operation. There was also an intercom box, which was one of the more successful parts of the system. It allowed the pilot and observer to communicate by voice without having to shout over the engine noise. So we will be displaying the BC-11A control box that was mounted in the aircraft. And that's the microphone that is worn around the neck. The helmet had integrated earphones, which was an advanced feature for the time. And uh, there's how it would be displaying the gallery. I apologize, it's a little dark photograph. Okay, the last artifact in this category is a gyroscope used in the Kettering Aerial Torpedo, the forerunner of modern cruise missiles. Also known as the Liberty Eagle, or commonly as the Kettering Bug, it was a small, unmanned aircraft that could fly without outside input to a target and destroy it. The gyro developed by Elmer Sperry was an integral part of its guidance system. Although only 45 Kettering Bugs were made and they were never used in combat, Sperry's gyroscopes, which had already revolutionized ship navigation, would do the same for aircraft and would become integral to advanced aircraft fire control, bombing, and autopilot systems, among others. 
And there you see the bug from the front and the back. Uh, it's on its dolly, on its launch rails. And here's our gyro with a presentation plaque. Um, this gyroscope is actually from the very first Kettering bug, uh, which crashed, <laughs> uh, interesting uh, association, on its first flight on October 2nd, 1918. Um, and it's mounted on a uh, piece of wood from the spar of the aircraft. Okay, so uh, in previous versions of the World War, War, World War I gallery, as you saw, um, we had displays of original uniforms, but by the time the most recent version was deinstalled, only reproductions were on display. With the new gallery, we are excited to put some of our significant original uniforms on public display. Our first uniform is from Kiffin Yates Rockwell. Rockwell joined the French Foreign Legion at the beginning of the war. Uh, he was wounded and then transferred to the Air Service and became one of the original members of the Lafayette Escadrille. On May, May 18, 1916, he became the first American to shoot down an enemy plane during the war. And that is his uniform. Uh, it was donated, donated by his brother Paul, who also served with him in the Foreign Legion. Uh, the uniform is in amazing condition. Um, no bug damage at all. Uh, it was probably worn less than six months before Rockwell was killed on September 23rd, 1916. His brother had it packed away until he donated it to the museum in 1962. And there's a close-up of uh, French aviation insignia on the collar. And we also have his Medaille Militaire and Croix de Guerre, and they will also be on display. Okay, this next uniform, I'm, I'm really happy to see going into the gallery because I had a hand in collecting it. Um, it's the uniform of Lieutenant Ray Kraut, who was a DH-4 pilot in the U.S. 135th Aero Squadron. Uh, which was the first squadron to fly American-made DH-4s. So his daughter contacted me in 2017 about donating a German machine gun uh, her father brought home from the war, which was my connection to it. Um, unfortunately, that machine gun is not going in the gallery, but uh, that's another story. Um, uh, so as we were making arrangements for Carl and I to go, uh, go collect the machine gun, um, almost as an afterthought, uh, uh, she mentions to me, the daughter, that uh, she also had his uniform. And I thought, hmm, that's an a, you know, important detail to leave out. Uh, <laughs> I immediately told her we were interested in it. Uh, so when I saw the uniform, though, I was a bit let down. Um, those of you who know about uniforms, I'm going to go into a lot of details here. <laughs> the first thing I noticed was the open lapel collar. Um, the regulation U.S. uniform during the war had a high closed collar, and it wasn't until 1925 that an open collar was adopted. Since Kraut had flown in the Air Guard after the war, I thought maybe this was a later uniform of his, not World War I. Um, sometimes the family stories, uh, when she first called me, she said he was a fighter pilot in the 102nd Squadron or something, and so it turned out he was a DH-4 pilot in the... Uh, 135th, he flew in the 102nd as in his air guard time. So things get a little complicated sometimes. So as curator, um, I know you can't tell the artifact what it is. You have to let the artifact tell you. So I started looking closer. I knew that American pilots sometimes had open collar tunics tailored after the British style since they were more comfortable in flight and Kraut had trained with the British. Um, so pictures of Rickenbacker and the one I had at the beginning slide of Douglas Campbell, um, they, they both show that, that they both had open collar tunics. So it was possible this was the real deal. I first looked at the insignia, wings, overseas stripes, and the rank badges, and they all looked right for the World War I period. The U.S. and Air, Air Service insignia, as well as the buttons, were bronze, not gold and silver, as was regulation on later uniforms. Also, the later uniform had the U.S. on the collar and the wings uh, badge on the lapel, and they were mirrored on both sides. Not one on each side, as you see here. 
Now, I'd seen other World War I uniforms where this was done, and um, my explanation is that regulations didn't cover insignia on non-regulation tunics, so they kind of did what they, they felt was right. There's a close-up um, of the collar. Um, so I knew that this uh, shoulder uh, unit insignia that in general these badges were not worn during the war but they appeared soon after a lot of the troops sewed them on when they were going home. Uh, Crouch stayed in theater there for uh, mid-1919 uh, flying people around. Um, now this uh, second army patch was originally red over white that's faded here um, but that fit with the 135th service under that army starting in October of 1918. The second army was demobilized in April 1919, about the same time Kraut was sent home. So it was not reestablished until the early 1930s, and Kraut's Air Guard service, which began in 1929, was not under that unit. So I was fairly certain that that badge pertained to his World War I service, and that this was actually an authentic uh, World War I, likely worn on flying duties uniform. Uh, with the one addition of that badge immediately post-armistice. So I didn't think there was much more to be learned from the uniform, but when the conservators began readying it for display, we saw some interesting features that were visible on close examination, and they confirmed my previous conclusions. It may be a little hard to tell in this photo, um, but if you look closely, pull in, yeah, um, you will notice several shades of material visible on the pockets. Um, both the pockets are slightly darker. Um, the inside under the buttons here, and then this band on the waist. Um, the waistband was added uh, to pad out the uniform because that's where this, the leather Sam Bel Brown belt um, was worn, and the Sam Brown was not authorized in the U.S. Um, uh, they were really against it, but they had become popular for the, the other allied uh, services that wore it in Europe, so likely worn uh, proves it was worn in Europe. Um, that piece in the front there was added because now that this is a lapel, you have to have some nice material to face it instead of this just being a straight up um, closed collar uniform. Um, and uh, the pockets were um, a little, little confusing, but uh, I'll get those in a second. Uh, and here, it's again a little hard to tell, but they had to add a little triangle here to, to make a lapel. And you can see they're, they're very small, they're not uh, the normal size. Okay, uh, so the pockets were confusing. Um, I don't know why they added new upper pockets, because to me they look exactly like U.S. shape regulation pockets. But the bottom pockets are, are pretty obvious. Um, on the bottom pockets on US uniforms, they're sewn down all the way around the edges. But on British uniforms, you have a gusset in there so that the pocket's expandable. And they thought this was a neat idea. So this material, which again, it's hard to tell in this picture, is a, of a different uh, vintage than the, the other parts. And also this pocket has more of a square British style look to it than the, the rounded U.S. regulation. So why is that important <laughs> beyond <laughs> being, uh, uh, you know, a getting obsessed with details? Well, all these little de details, they do confirm the vintage of the tunic and tell the story, um, and this is the interesting part I, I found, is what it tells you about the, the people who wore these. Um, so they were succumbing to both comfort and its style. Um, but not at the expense of purchasing a completely new uniform. So um, that's how it's going to look in the gallery. And we thought it was going to be a little bit odd um, by itself. So we actually did put a reproduction uh, shirt and tie on it uh, to show how it would have looked worn. So we're not going to forget the Navy. Um, this U.S. Naval Aviation uniform was worn by Joseph Klein. He was a member of the U.S. Navy's Aeronautic Detachment No. 1, which was the first U.S. military or naval unit to arrive in France on, uh, in World War I. The unit was based at Le Croisic, which was the first United States Naval Air Station organized in France. 
It was also the first completed and the first to begin operations in November 1917. Uh, there was some mention in the file uh, that Klein may have flown the first mission out of that base, which would have made him the first pilot to fly a combat mission, U.S. pilot, service pilot, to fly a combat mission in World War I. Mitchell had flown as an observer on a French aircraft about six months earlier, but then there was also some research someone had done, and some of the veterans claimed it was another person. <laughs> so I'm not making that claim for Klein, but he was a, a, in that unit and was an early, uh, early pilot. Um, so um, the principal objective of having a station at Le Croisic was to provide aerial escorts for the troop convoys coming into the Loire River. Unfortunately, we didn't have Ensign Klein's service cap, so we paired the tunic with Ensign James Stilwell's cap, worn while on stateside duty during the war. We don't normally do that, but it just seemed like that the Navy needed to have a, a fairly complete uniform. So I want to relate here a somewhat humorous story from Klein's unpublished memoirs about an accident that could have turned out much worse. So in his words, uh, we flew French Tellier seaplanes powered by 220 Hispano engines, which you see here. This is one that I think came back to the United States. Um, and our job was to escort the convoys from the States through our sector from Quiberon to Saint-Nazaire in defense against the threat of submarines. Le Quasi was a, a little fishing village on the north coast of Brittany and was always a welcome sight after a long, cold four-hour patrol. One afternoon, I taxied to the outer harbor, warmed up my engine before taking off an atelier on patrol, headed into the wind, rocked the plane on the step, was just about to pull her off when a tremendous explosion blew the plane in half. <laughs> Someone had not cocked the trigger spring properly on the two Mark IV bombs hung under the wings on each side of the boat, and the vibration at takeoff caused them to fall off, sink into nine feet of water, and explode. The time it took for the bombs to hit the bottom and detonate was just enough at my speed to take the forward half of the boat outside the point of eruption. The after half, uh, right behind the engine section, was sliced off as though cut with a saw. So right back there. <laughs> there was a lighthouse at the harbor entrance 80 feet high, and people who saw and heard the blast said the after part and tail surface were blown 50 feet higher, so 130 feet in the air. Uh, the weight of the engine made the forward part sink stern first, my observer, Fred Lovejoy, and I started shedding clothes. <laughs> um, we released our carrier pigeons, for those of you who were worried about the pigeons drowning, um, and prepared to swim to the beach, which was not far, but the remaining half of the ship settled in that nine feet of water. We climbed on the nose, which was out of the water, and waited for the crash boat to come and get us. Neither of us had a scratch. I was only wet to my knees, but we both could have used a drink. So the hazards of flying in World War I that have nothing to do with the enemy, well, little to do with the enemy. So the formation of the first independent air force, the RAF, on April 1st, 1918, is an important part of our story. Um, we have the, in the collection an early RAF uniform worn by this man, Captain Pierre Pattison. The limited information I have been able to find on him is that he was a BE-2E pilot in Number 8 Squadron RFC and was shot down and wounded in uh, Bloody April, April 10, 1917. He was able to land with his observer, 2nd Lieutenant Mills, but the aircraft was destroyed by shelling. So he must have returned to duty since he was a 2nd Lieutenant in 1917, but at this time in the photo you can see he's a captain. The first RAF uniform was a blend of the, tradi blend of the tra excuse me, traditions <laughs> of the two services that were combined to create the RAF, being the RFC and the RNAS. Uh, 
The uniform was the same color as the Army uniform, but rank was represented by cuff rings as used on Navy uniforms. Until 1919, Army rank names were still used, so these two rings uh, represent the rank of captain, not flight lieutenant, as the later um, uh, naval-influenced ranks would be. The vertical bar is his wound stripe from when he was shot down. And anybody who knows uniforms, and especially RAF uniforms, this is missing something. It should have two metal eagles here uh, facing forward on each side. So at some point they were pilfered or possibly reused on another uniform. It's hard to say. So the RFC, as part of the Army, had worn rank, in sh- uh, rank on their shoulder straps and unit badges on their collars. When looking at this uniform, it's had the superfluous shoulder rank straps removed, but you can still see holes left from the RFC collar badges or collar dogs. See them right there and right there. So, once again, like Crouch's uniform, this uniform shows that airmen didn't run out and buy a new uniform when changes were made. Now, since we don't have an interwar gallery, uh, as Roger uh, said, the World War I gallery must point to some of the developments that followed the armistice. One person that loomed large, at least in the U.S., was Billy Mitchell and his campaign for the formation of an independent air force. As we saw earlier, we will have his flight suit displayed, but it is shown in the context of specialized flight clothing for aviators. To focus on Mitchell himself, we decided to also display one of his uniforms. We have several in the collection, both wartime and later, so we had to decide which one to use. We settled on this open collar uniform of the type that was approved first for air air service officers in 1925 and a year later for the rest of the Army. From this photo that you see here that is in our database, I assumed it was a summer khaki tan version of the U.S. officer uniform. But I learned you can't even trust color photos. When I saw the uniform in person, it was actually a chocolate brown color. And it's, it was even, it's even slightly darker than this picture shows. And so it's kind of a mystery to me. Um, The fabric is like a light gabardine suit wool, but the color isn't the same as a light khaki tan summer uniform, which, in fact, was not even issued until the 1930s, uh, slightly after this uniform. Um, Now, officer service coats were allowed to be made in lighter fabrics, such as cotton, for summer wear, but they were supposed to be the OD green of the um, winter, the heavier wool uniform. Now, for comparison here, you can see his embroidered bullion uh, uh, U.S. and uh, branch insignia. They are backed with that heavier whipcord green wool that you would normally see on a dark winter uniform. Um, So, what conclusion can I draw from this? Um, Like many other cases, Billy Mitchell just did what he wanted. Uh, He had his uniform tailored out of a comfortable fabric that was close enough in color. And he was Billy Mitchell. And there is proof that it's his. Uh, This is the tailor's tag in the pocket showing it was made in Washington, D.C. The date is also pretty interesting. This is just under three months before his court-martial began in November 1925. So the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force also has two of Mitchell's open collar uniforms on display. Um, But the evidence of that date in the pocket, and I did a careful uh, comparison of the ribbons and badges uh, on all those uniforms and ours, and that's convinced me that this is actually the uniform he is wearing this famous picture at his trial. And there's the coat mounted and ready for display. The Sam Brown is slightly askew in that picture. And just to confuse things, it appears to have a greenish tint in this photo. Okay, next section. uh, This is uh, 
one of my uh, collections I'm responsible for, so you may hear a lot about things here, uh, aircraft weapons. Uh, in the previous galley, there was almost a complete lack of these outside of the guns mounted in the aircraft, uh, so I was pleased that we were able to include a fairly good selection throughout the gallery. Okay, I'm starting off a section of weapons with a photo of an aircraft. But it's not the aircraft I want to point out, but what you can see under the lower wings just outboard of the fuselage. Those are bombs located in bomb racks. When the museum's Dayton Wright DH-4 was received from the War Department in 1919, and after its restoration in 1981, when this photo was taken, the aircraft was equipped with these bomb racks. Now, when it was decided to hang the aircraft in the Looking at Earth gallery in the museum, the, the aircraft's aerial reconnaissance mission was the focus, and bomb racks only added weight, so they were left off. So they will be seen um, for the first time in a while. The new gallery, however, will focus on the many roles and missions that the aircraft fulfilled. Along with reconnaissance and artillery spotting, bombing was one of the important jobs of the often unheralded two-seat aircraft. So we pulled the racks out of storage, and here you can see our conservator working on them. They have been left off for shipping, but will, will be reattached once the aircraft goes into the gallery. Here's one of the finished racks upside down. Now, I was surprised to find out that the bombs are not, not actually real shakes. They are made of wood. Um, we didn't remove them from the rack at the time. Uh, it seemed like it was unnecessary. So I wasn't able to examine them to determine if these are actually Mark I dummy bombs, which were made out of wood, or somebody just made copies of the Mark II explosive bombs. In keep, uh, excuse me. In keeping with the bomb theme, this is the RL 112-pound bomb developed before the war by the British Royal Laboratory located at the Royal Arsenal in Woolwich in southeast London. The RNAS was the main proponent of aerial bombing before the war, with the RSC concentrating on reconnaissance. The Royal Laboratory produced a light case 100-pound bomb for blast effect against submarines, and this heavier 112-pound bomb which was better for penetration and fragmentation effect. Despite very few of these bombs being ready at the start of the war, the RL 112-pound bomb would go on to be one of the standard bombs of the British bombing campaign. By March 1918, there were orders for 5,000 weekly. It was the main bomb dropped by the strategic bombers of the independent force. Now, originally these bombs were painted yellow, so our bomb appeared to be in line with this practice, if somewhat dirty and faded. Um, closer examination revealed peeling paint, and we considered a complete strip and repaint. We decided that the conservator should first remove a preservative coating, and, uh, which we felt was responsible for this brownish tint. As was becoming common with many of these artifacts, once we got to look at them, surprise, after removing the preservative, the top coat, paint coat was brushed on blue. The U.S. used and still does use blue paint to denote dummy or practice bombs. This bomb was donated with a large collection of artifacts by the U.S. Air Force after World War II. And we don't really have its history. Um, so I had to decide at this point, should we strip the paint and repaint it to look in, uh, as it would have in World War I? Um, that's one of those tough decisions that curators must make, but uh, the trend currently is to preserve original material at the expense of making something look new. In the end, without knowing why it had been painted blue, we decided to leave it be. Future research may reveal why it was painted that way, but if we destroy the evidence now, it will be permanently, permanently gone. And that's how it uh, looks once it's cleaned up. Now, our next bomb was not our first choice to be in the exhibit, but I'm glad it made it in. We intended to display the spherical German APK bomb, which you see at the bottom, and that long fragmentation bomb, which were in the previous version of the gallery. 
Um, the APK bomb was easy to identify. We couldn't get a positive idea on that long bomb. It, it may not even be German. Um, so we're at sort of an impasse at this point um, um, and decided to look at what else was in the collection. And we came across this. Now, I had looked briefly at this, but uh, Carl came back and said, you really need to look at this one. <laughs> so uh, I did. And uh, it, um, after looking at it, it, it was a, an obvious and a perfect choice. Um, this is a German carbonate 10 kilogram incendiary bomb. The bombs manufactured by Sprengstoff AG Carbonit, a pre-war mining explosives manufacturer, in both incendiary and high explosive versions, replaced the pre-war spherical APK bombs, being somewhat more aerodynamic. They would in turn be replaced by the streamlined PUW bombs. So this bomb was filled um, at the airfields with benzene and petroleum through this fill pipe with the red cap. When it was dropped, air pressure would force this disc here up, which would free the vein and allow it to spin and arm the bomb. Now the bomb had what looked like the remains of a paper label stuck to the side. Having seen displays of captured weapons with placards stuck to them describing what they are, I figured that that's what we were looking at here. And I asked the remains to be cleaned off as they were not original. The conservator, on the other hand, first wanted to take some infrared photos to see if, it, if they revealed anything. And I didn't really understand what they might reveal, but I said, you know, what harm can it do? Well, probably the biggest um, surprise and uh, possible mistake on this project, infrared revealed German Gothic writing on those placards. This is actually the instruction label that was pasted to these bombs, and that's something I've never seen before, is an instruction label. Um, unfortunately, not enough remains of the label to read the instructions, but the filling process was apparently complicated, dangerous, or both, and had to be explained. So an internet search, uh, of course, showed period pictures of these bombs with their labels intact. Uh, it would be interesting someday to try to fill in the missing words, but uh, we just don't have enough of it right now. My final airdropped weapon, the Rankin Dart, was meant to counter the Zeppelins that carried the incendiary bombs. Early attempts to shoot down airships with regular ball or even incendiary ammunition were mostly unsuccessful because the round would pass through the gas bags without igniting the hydrogen. Lieutenant Commander Francis Rankin, Royal Navy, developed the dart in 1915. They were dropped on zeppelins, and after penetrating the envelope, the arms on the tail there, would catch in the fabric. The front part of the body here would continue going, and there was a wire between the two. When that wire went taut, it fired the charge in the front part, so this would be hanging up on the, the envelope. This would be in the middle of the hydrogen bag and would explode and that was supposed to, to work. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't uh, that successful. One of the problems was you had to be above the Zeppelin to drop them down, so you had to get above it, which was always a problem in those early aircraft. Um, and it really, that problem wasn't solved until the introduction of a combination of explosive and incendiary machine gun rounds um, that they uh, could start to bring down Zeppelins. Now, our Rankin Dart, you see it looks real nice there, uh, is actually nickel-plated. It was a presentation example uh, presented by Commander Rankin to Major Jeffrey Moore, no relation, who tested the darts for Rankin in a Bristol bullet. Major Moore donated the dart to the museum in 1962. So as you may be noticing, with some, at least some of our armament, uh, we didn't, do tend to be a little more international than... Uh, uh, just an American focused here, so this is one of the ways that uh, uh, we can bring in the larger story. And it's kind of neat, you can see the manufacturer's name right there, Edinburgh. Okay, in addition to airdrop weapons, we also have several firearms in the exhibit. One of the rare pieces in our collection is this Mondragon semi-automatic rifle. It was designed by a Mexican army officer 
and was manufactured in Switzerland by SIG. It was the first semi-auto rifle accepted by any military and the first to be used in combat in the Mexican Revolution. And remember, this is 30 years before the U.S. adopted the M1 Garand. After about 400 were delivered to Mexico, their army decided that they were too expensive and their performance in dirty conditions was marginal. So when war came in 1914, the German army uh, bought up the uh, rest of the approximately 3,600 rifles from SIG. After coming to the same conclusions as the Mexicans about the reliability, they decided to issue them to the German Air Force, where the dirty conditions wouldn't be an issue. In this early stage of the war, machine guns were still too heavy and unwieldy, and airmen carried basic service weapons. The Germans reasoned a semi-auto rifle could be fired more quickly than the bolt-action Mauser service rifles, and the rifle caliber would make it more effective than the Mauser and Luger semi-automatic pistols that were being issued. It was also shortened to make it easier to handle in an airplane and equipped with a 30-round snail drum magazine. So the Mondragon, I believe, is uh, the first uh, firearm issued solely for use in airplanes. I think we're lucky to have a sample of it, an example of it. We will also have examples of most of the machine guns used on aircraft during the war, with apologies to the Austro-Hungarians. The Schwarzloza had to be eliminated early on due to space issues. One of the things we wanted to do was emphasize how the gun synchronizer revolutionized aerial warfare. To illustrate this, we plan to display both Allied and Central Powers later war synchronization systems. So this is the Fokker's Central Steuerung Gear, and here's the Allied Constantinesco Kali or CC gear. This being the fluid reservoir and the firing handle which would be attached to the control stick. And here's the tubing <laughs> that attaches the trigger motor on the end there that actually fires the gun. Um, we originally were going to display the parts separately, but it occurred to me we really needed to show them as a complete system with the gun. I had no idea how much space this would take, so I got the dimensions of the case and did a real-world layout. One problem, though, was this tubing, which the conservator said could not be rebent into the proper shape. Uh, so I decided to use modern copper tubing to replace it since we had to make it fit in uh, defined space. And there's the layout we did. So the, the green tape was the boundaries of what we had to work with. Uh, actually, the case got smaller after that. <laughs> uh, and the orange string that uh, looks kind of funny here uh, is, gonna r is representing the uh, modern copper tubing. As you see, we need it to fit into that space. So the one thing we're missing here, with the CC gear at least, is an impulse generator. And that attached to the engine and send the signals to the trigger when the propeller is out of the way. And that would go, these two tubings would uh, attach that there. So here's my plea, if anyone knows of anybody who has one, uh, we're, we would be, uh, we'd like to talk to them, willing to donate. So the last weapon I'll show is the Davis recoilless gun you see here. It was designed in 1910 by U.S. Navy Commander Cleland Davis as a large caliber weapon that would have little to no recoil. It accomplished this with a double-ended shell that held the round in one end and an equal mass of shot in the other. The round was loaded in the middle of the gun, and when fired, the equal forces of the round leaving one end and the shot leaving the other end canceled each other out, and there was no recoil as there is with a gun with a closed breech on one end. Uh, the, one of the main problems with that is you had to watch where this end was pointing, and if it was pointing at your top wing, that was not a good time to shoot because you had a mass of uh, basically shotgun firing out the back end. So this, this uh, seemed ideal for naval aircraft, which needed a larger round to attack surface ships and submarines, but would not damage the wooden structure of the aircraft with a violent recoil. The gun did not have a sight, but used a Lewis gun mounted on top to pro provide an aid to aiming. 
The Lewis would be fired first with the 30 caliber bullets giving an indication of what the Davis was pointing at. It's not a particularly accurate system. When the museum received its Felix Stowe F5L in 1924, it was equipped with a full complement of Lewis guns and a Davis gun. There were three, th three sizes of Davis gun, and ours is a six pounder, which works out to be about a two and a half inch or 62 millimeter diameter round. At some point in the last 100 years, all the weapons were removed from our aircraft and stored separately. The Davis gun was covered in a thick coat of preservative and crated. So this is what it looked like when we began to work on it. And here's a close-up of that gooey mess. As you can see, the spotter Lewis gun had been removed. Uh, unfortunately, when the Lewises were stored separately, some lost their connection to the aircraft in our records. So we actually kind of didn't know which guns were from the Felix Stowe. Uh, a little bit of a problem pre-digital pre age. So I happened to be looking through our database, and there was this old picture taken in the, you know, Polaroid taken in the 60s. Um, and I noticed on it, oh, it's got this interesting post mount, and it's hard to see, but there's a hole in the, in the middle of the pistol grip. And I immediately thought, huh, Davis gun. Uh, even though it had been accessioned in 1983. Um, a little bit of a problem in the old days. So next I had to find out where this gun went and uh, sure enough found it. Um, a, one of our curators, our uh, camera curator, had uh, we, nobody knew its provenance so they used it to mount this 1930s camera gun on. You can see the hole there. Uh, they'd taken the post mount off. Um, so research in the original donation records for the F5L also revealed that the Navy had thoughtfully provided the serial numbers of all the weapons, one thing the Army didn't do uh, on the DH-4, uh, so that I was able to actually use those serial numbers to positively confirm that this Lewis was the spotter for our Davis gun and to go around and locate all the other Lewis guns that had drifted apart. So we now know all the guns that go with the Felix Stowe. Some small things did happen to walk somewhere, um, and I'm still hoping maybe we'll find them in some dark corner. Uh, this adjustment knob here and the remote trigger for the Lewis uh, had to be remade, and our um, specialists in the shop just did an amazing job. This was recreated from the photograph. Uh, we had one of these on our twin Lewises on our DH-4, so they were able to copy it from there. Um, amazing work. So here it is all cleaned up and assembled and ready for display in the gallery. Um, notice the large shoulder rest there. Uh, and if you look close, you'll notice two triggers. This small one front fires the Lewis. This big one fires the Davis gun. And I'll just show you a few. Real, we had our, one of our photographers take really nice photos of this. So I'll show, just show you a couple photos here. You can see that remote trigger going down. Um, there's that, that pose, that unique pose. We can adjust the height of the gun. Um, it's also adjusted with that knob. This is the, the mounting post for the aircraft. And this is kind of cool um, because this shows how the gun breaks open in the middle. It has, it's almost like an artillery piece. It's got this locking handle and then it swings away on the rod down here, swings off to the side and you put the the round in here, so it's in the middle of the gun. The firing pin's right here, and that's the connection to the trigger, and it drops down, fires in the middle of the shell, and they go their separate ways and cancel each other out as far as recoil. Uh, and here's the marking. Um, if you can't read it from up there, it says Arrow 6-pounder, uh, Mark 12. It's got the, uh, the serial number, uh, the inspection, naval inspection, um, Stamps and the manufacturer's name right there, GO Company, 1918. And this is a real cool shot that our um, photographer did, and you can see it's looking down the barrel and see that rifling. Uh, it's really prominent there. And apparently this is a really hard shot to do because everything's in focus. He actually stitched several shots focused on different areas together. 
to make that. And not being a photographer, I probably don't appreciate it as much, but um, I thought it was uh, really cool looking. Okay, so the last category is models. Unfortunately, we don't have any of the models used during the war for aircraft recognition like you see at this French school. Um, you can see they, they painted a nice background. They've got a model there, down there, all, all over the place. I don't know if any of those exist. I've never seen one. You know, World War II is a different story, but um, um, we do use models in the gallery, mostly to represent aircraft we want to highlight. Even if they are a more recent production, these models are still valued artifacts in the collection. And uh, this is one I, I really am glad is going on display. Um, there are several models in the exhibit, but I'm only going to highlight two of the really special ones. Um, they're both large scale and have not been exhibited before in the museum. This sop with one and a half strutter, which uh, everyone knows was the first British airplane to be um, equipped with a forward firing machine gun, synchronized machine gun. Um, is one seventh scale. It has a wingspan of almost 50 inches. Uh, it was built by a gentleman by the name of Rob Trudnack, uh, completed in 2011. I was hoping to get it, sneak it into the old gallery because um, I'm not sure that he was in especially good health. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to, but it is going in this gallery. Um, if you're really interested, there is a whole, he did a whole build thing on the RC model forum, and it's just incredible the details, and we'll look at a quick. Um, a couple of those real quick. Um, he copied everything and down to, you know, multiple pieces. There's the underside with the console stick. The he had the, the straps over the, the fuel tank. Uh, there's some placards on the instrument panel. Decal on the strut. Handmade all those tires and wheels, and uh, the rear strut there. And you saw this one in in Rogers. Uh, this is a Fokker, Fokker D7, one six scale with a 59 inch wingspan. Uh, it's half covered in the markings of Yasta 53's Offizier Stellvertreter Fritz Blumenthal. Um, Actually, when the model came in, it had a different covering. Um, they decided it wasn't quite accurate, so they had somebody recover it. Uh, but the model itself is just uh, spe spectacular. A uh, um, gentleman by the name of Fred Muller built this. Uh, he built an SC-5A, a, a Newport 17, and a SPAD 13, all in this scale. I wish we would have got all of those. Um, again, if you're interested in it, there's an article in Scale Modeler in September of 1968. You can read all about it. Um, again, details. Here's the other uncovered half. Machine guns, gauges. Even got the uh, the firing cables to the, the hand control and the throttle cable. It's amazing. And all these panels, uh, the panels that were here come off and removed. Okay, so that's a look at some of the artifacts that are going in the new gallery. As I said, most of them have not been on display in the museum before. We're also displaying more artifacts than in the previous gallery. I feel that the ones I've shown here are some of the more noteworthy artifacts, but there are probably about five to six times more uh, than I, what I've shown you today going in the gallery. Um, hopefully you've seen... Uh, Hopefully what you've seen in this and Roger's presentations um, have generated interest and hopefully excitement in the new gallery, and we invite everyone to come see it when it opens in 2025. And with that, you can release your metaphorical p pigeons and uh, send me your questions. Uh, you, thank you. Thank you. You might owe Carl a minute or two. <laughs> uh, we don't really have a lot of time for questions. Lunch is being served out just outside the tabled area. Uh, I hope that uh, you'll be able to perhaps answer some questions sure. from people wandering around, but we don't want to delay the lunch. 
We're going to come back here, and the next session starts at 2 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>